So in this video, we're going to look at the equatorial mount once again, and specifically how they can be used to determine a very accurate radius of the Earth. But before I do, I just want to give a quick shout out and thank you to Mike the Globetard for making these stickers, and Where's Wally for sending them to me. And there you can see, I have one fitted to the side of my Celestron 9.25 inch telescope. So thanks once again guys, this is Mike's channel, Mike the Globetard, and this is Where's Wally, and as you can see, he spells it with two ones instead of L's. At the end of my presentation, I'm going to come back and talk a little more about some of his recent videos. And just briefly, one question I get asked occasionally is how powerful is this telescope compared to something like a Nikon P900? I'll show you. That is a Nikon P900 at maximum optical zoom. This is from the same distance using the large telescope with a camera fitted to the back. So as you can see, it is significantly more powerful than the P900. So in the past, we have covered equatorial mounts quite extensively on this channel. I've given flat earthers the opportunity to demonstrate how they could work on a flat earth. And of course, they were incapable of doing so. We followed up on that by showing them how the equatorial mount works perfectly on a globe and then in a subsequent challenge, we also showed them just why the equatorial mount cannot work on a flat earth. It is quite apparent that there are still some flat earthers out there who struggle to understand the geometry of the equatorial mount. So I'll do another short presentation on that, and that will lead into how we can calculate the radius of the earth. This is a manual for a Skywatcher equatorial mount, and what I'll do is just read this paragraph. A problem for many beginners is recognizing that a polar aligned equatorial mount acts like an alt azimuth mount, which has been aligned to a celestial pole. The wedge tilts the mount to an angle equal to the observer's latitude, and therefore it swivels around a plane which parallels the celestial and Earth's equator. This is now its horizon, but remember, that part of the new horizon is usually blocked by the Earth. This new azimuth motion is called right ascension. In addition, the mount swivels north and south from the celestial equator towards the celestial poles. This plus or minus altitude from the celestial equator is called declination. Now, as you can see in this diagram, we have the plane of the local horizon we also have the plane of the celestial equator. Now what the equatorial mount does is align the polar axis so that it rotates in this same plane as the celestial equator. And that is why it only requires a single axis of rotation to follow objects in the sky. Because this plane is perpendicular to the rotational axis of the Earth. Here we can see a globe that is constantly rotating. Now remember, the purpose of an equatorial mount is to cancel Earth's rotation. So let's consider firstly, positioning this equatorial mount directly at the North Pole. And what you will see on most equatorial mounts is a latitude scale. And there you can see, I have set the latitude to 90 on this equatorial mount. And therefore, the polar axis is going to be directly up because right on the North Pole, pointing directly up is going to be in line with the rotational axis of the Earth. So all this mount needs to do is rotate in this direction at the same speed that the Earth is rotating and it will be cancelling out the Earth's rotation. But if we move away from the North Pole to 45 degrees North Latitude, for example, we have to set the equatorial mount accordingly. And there you can see, I have set it to 45 degrees Latitude. 
Now in this case, as the mount rotates in that single axis, it is still compensating for the rotation of the Earth because this axis through here is still aligned with the rotational axis of the Earth. And if we move to the equator, we need to set the latitude base on the equatorial mount to zero, as you can see there. And that way, this same single axis of rotation is compensating for the rotation of the Earth. So I plan to do this next part as a video, but it was just unmanageable with only two hands. So I took three photographs. In this one, I have the equatorial mount set to a latitude of 90. So we're at the North Pole. And as you can see, the rotating axis on this mount is in line with the Earth's rotating axis. Now, if we move to a position at 45 degrees and we set the latitude base to 45 degrees, you can again see that the rotating axis on the mount is in line with the Earth's rotating axis. And similarly, at the equator, with the equatorial mount set to zero degrees latitude, this rotating axis on the telescope mount is still in line with the Earth's rotating axis. So that's the key. What's actually occurring is this rotating axis doesn't change its orientation relative to the rotating axis of the Earth. But because we are moving around the curve of the Earth, we have to set a different angle on this equatorial mount base. And that is why they have a latitude scale, because every degree of latitude is 60 nautical miles. And we have 90 degrees from the North Pole to the equator. So that is 5,400 nautical miles. The equatorial mount absolutely confirms that we need to change the angle by one degree for every 60 nautical miles. And here's a great animation showing how that equatorial mount base changes the angle as you change latitude. So your telescope can be used no matter where you are on the northern hemisphere and also the southern hemisphere. So what does an equatorial mount tell us about the radius of the Earth? Well, as we have seen in previous videos, it cannot work on a flat Earth. It only works if the Earth is a ball. Now, any flat Earther who is still claiming that an equatorial mount works on a flat Earth is really just telling you that he doesn't understand the geometry of how they work. There's no way around it, guys. The equatorial mounts do not work on a flat earth. Believing they do is just showing us that you don't understand the geometry at all. So we know that one degree of latitude on the earth is 60 nautical miles. A complete circle is 360 degrees. So if we have 360 times 60, we end up with a circumference of 21,600 nautical miles. Now, if we divide that by pi and then divide by two, we get the radius of the ball in nautical miles, which is 3,437.74 nautical miles. We now convert that to kilometers and we get a figure of 6,366 kilometers. So the equatorial mount is telling us that the radius of the Earth is 6,366 kilometers. What is the official figure? There it is, 6,371 kilometers. We're seeing just a five kilometer difference. Now that represents an error of less than 0.1% from the official figure. In fact, that figure of 6366 kilometers could be used to calculate flight plans and they would still work very accurately on the real Earth. 
it is less than 0.1 of a percent difference. So let's go through the math with a calculator. We have 60 nautical miles per degree multiplied by 360 degrees in a circle. We have a circumference of 21,600 nautical miles. Divide by pi gives us the diameter. Divide by 2 gives us the radius. 3437.74 nautical miles. We now multiply by 1.852 to get kilometers. 6366. In fact, it's 0.7, so you could round that up to 6367 which means there is even less discrepancy from the official figure. Less than five kilometers difference, less than 0.1 of a percent. So the equatorial mount has given us a very accurate radius for the Earth. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I just wanted to come back briefly to Where's Wally's channel. He's producing some excellent videos recently, and one in particular, Greater Sapien, The Day the Sun Stood Still. As many of you may know, Greater Sapien completed a round-the-world journey for research and has been sharing some of that footage with Where's Wally. And this one is from the flight from Sydney, Australia, non-stop to Johannesburg in South Africa. And there was video footage taken from the window because the aircraft went so far south, it was actually crossing longitude faster than the movement of the sun. And therefore, the sun was not moving across the sky as it normally would. It was actually going in the opposite direction for a very short period of time. And what Wes Wally has also done is compare the cloud patterns seen from the aircraft with those taken from weather satellites. It's a great analysis. I strongly recommend checking it out for yourself.